I will cross the ocean for you. I will go and bring you the moon. Today we're going to discuss one of the most well-known singers from the 90s and early 2000s. And she goes by the name Monica. She sold over 5 million albums in the US alone. And Billboard even recognized her as one of the biggest R&B artists of the past 25 years. Not only was she an accomplished singer, but she also had a brief forays into acting and reality TV. And she has lived a very full and complex life, with her experiences ranging from traumatizing and tragic, like the time she lost her boyfriend, to beautiful and joyous like her Grammy win, the births of her children, to her decade-long romance with NBA player Shannon Brown. She began singing from a very young age, lending her vocals to a gospel choir as a kid. And by the time she was 14 years old, she had two consecutive number one singles on the R&B chart. Today we're not talking about your average singer. Monica has paved the way for many R&B singers today, but that didn't happen without her experiencing a few minor shortcomings, like her beef with Brandy and Sierra. But despite this, she has seemingly managed to keep her nose clean when it comes to controversy. Today we'll be discussing her life in detail, and it's been one hell of a ride. So sit back, relax, maybe grab a snack, because this is gonna be one hell of a video. Let's begin. What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. So Monica was born Monica Denise Arnold in College Park, Georgia on October 24th, 1980 as the only daughter of her parents, Marilyn Arnold and MC Billy Arnold Jr. Her mother worked for an airline, while Billy was a mechanic for an Atlanta freight company. Predominantly of African-American origin, Monica's DNA was quite exotic. She was partly Indian and partly Irish thanks to her father's blood. Her parents would go on to have another child, Monica's brother Montez around 1993, before they separated around 1994 and filed for divorce around 1997. It's kind of like when I say, it's kind of a mixture of two worlds. That's just what I became. When my parents split, I became two separate people. Following Billy and Marilyn's divorce, Monica and Montez were raised in Riverdale, Georgia by their mother and her new husband, their stepfather, Reverend Edward Best, who was also a Methodist minister, one who helped Monica a lot during her upbringing. Interestingly, through her stepfather, Monica was also now related to future rapper and producer Ludacris. Just like that. Just like that. Who was her stepfather's nephew. And on top of that, Monica had a connection to producer Polo the Don, who was already her cousin. As far as her music career goes, Monica didn't have much of a choice. Music was in her blood. Her mother was a trained gospel singer and sang in the choir, passing her gift along to her first two children. When Monica was around two to four years old, she began singing in the choir at church, and this gave her a taste of what would happen if she sang in front of a bunch of people. So make it easier. Let the children laugh. Remind the sound we used to be. So she kept going. And by the time she was 10 years old, she joined a 12-man traveling gospel choir called Charles Thompson and the Majestics as its youngest member. And she was regularly performing at talent shows in order to get noticed. So around 1991, Monica entered a talent show in Atlanta and it was here that she got her first career-defining moment. While performing a rendition of Whitney Houston's classic, Greatest Love of All, Monica caught the attention of producer Dallas Austin, who was so blown away by her musical skills that he offered her a record deal with Arista, distributed by Rowdy Records. Naturally, Monica accepted the deal, signing around 1992 when she was around 12 years old, and soon after, Dallas enlisted the help of Queen Latifah to be her manager. 
Now at the time Queen Latifah was two albums in, she dropped All Hail the Queen around 1989 and Nature of a Sister around 1991. So with Queen Latifah's guidance, and because Queen Latifah was also a female in the game, she was a perfect person to mentor Monica. Now Monica's relationship with Dallas was more than a standard working relationship. He essentially adopted the role of her father, a role left empty because Monica's father was not in her life in her early years. So Dallas would show up at her school, whisking her away to the studio to record new material. He always took time for me. And I remember one time he had Madonna wait for like six hours just to take me out to this boat at Lake Lanier because I said I couldn't swim. I had never been out that way and he's like a fish in water. And I really noticed, gosh, this man has all the time in the world. He always made my mother feel comfortable. And that's how I always thought in my mind parents should be. And that's where I established in my head, okay, he is very deserving of being called my daddy. He allowed her plenty of freedom and the right to veto music, video concepts, and ideas for her image. So if she wasn't feeling something, she could be like, nah, I'm not doing that. So between 1993 and 1995, Monica worked on her debut album, recording and putting in the hours and effort to ensure that the lyrics and music reflected her persona, with the finished product arriving around 1995 under the title Miss Thang after a nickname given to her by Dallas. Dallas would bring producers in the studio to play records for me, and I'd be quick to say no if I didn't feel it. I knew who I was and what I wanted to say. That's where Miss Thang came from. He'd say, Miss Thang don't like it. Generally, the album got mixed reviews, and it also incorporated a lot of sounds, including soul, pop, hip hop, and the blues. It peaked at number 36 on the Billboard 200 selling pretty well commercially despite its sketchy chart performance. The album spawned four singles with the first two, Don't Take It Personal and Before You Walk Out Of My Life, both making headways in the game. The songs both went platinum while the other two singles, Like This and Like That and Why I Love You So Much, were also very successful going platinum and gold. So at this point it was very clear that Monica was becoming a star. Now despite doing everything she can to blow up in the music business, she took her education very seriously, many thanks to her mother's support, and she graduated high school around 1997 with a 4.0 GPA. At the time she was only 16 years old. She also attended North Clayton High School at one point, alongside rapper 2 Chains. But she ultimately left mainstream schooling around 1995 and completed her secondary education at Atlanta Country Day School. So, while Monica was clearly focused on her music, she didn't let that deter her from getting an education. My mom was very serious. She went above and beyond. She kept us in private school up until the 7th grade. I mean, she was really determined. Our summers, we didn't sit around and get lazy. She did everything. She was involved in every night and hour schoolwork, and I knew that meant a lot to her. And I made a promise to her that I wouldn't stray away from school and not have anything to fall back on, just for music. And that was something I really, really wanted to do. I was motivated to do my best, and I didn't find out that I actually had a 4.0. But I should have known because when I got report cards, like everybody else, and I always had A's, you know, they calculate the numbers at the end of the year. So to find that out, I was really, really excited about that because that's always something, if I want to go to college, I'll always have that line in there so I can do that. So with her education finally behind her and her promise to her mother fulfilled, Monica was finally ready to take on the music business. Unfortunately, while she had continued to perform and tour, in addition to dedicating four hours straight to her education daily, it wasn't until around 1997 that she finally finished her task and had enough time to return to the studio to work on her sophomore album. In those two years, her label home Rowdy Records had virtually fallen apart and despite the label being in the game for about five years, Monica's album was probably the only one that was successful on the label. Rowdy Records eventually faced creative differences with Arista 
and they eventually left the label, leaving Monica in the dust while the label itself, Rowdy Records, tried to go independent. So by 1998, Rowdy Records had completely folded, and Monica had to adjust to her new place in Arista under Clive Davis. But despite this, she still maintained a very close working relationship with Dallas, even though she was no longer on his label. It couldn't have been anybody better to have signed me at that age because he treated me as his daughter. He never made me feel like, if she's not selling records, she's not important. It was always about, look, are you okay? Is this too much? You don't have to do this. Everything about who you are is great. Don't let them tell you different. If I'm not present to say it for you, you say it yourself. So without Dallas to coach her at all times, and without her previous label, Monica kept on grinding. In fact, she grew up a lot between her first and second albums, releasing the platinum certified top five hit for You, I Will from the Space Jam soundtrack around 1997. I will cross the ocean for you. I will go and bring you the moon. It seemed like Monica also paid close attention to Queen Latifah's career because she also branched off into acting and television appearing as herself in an episode of New York Undercover and in a minor role in an episode of Living Single around 1996. The following year, she appeared as herself again in two episodes of Beverly Hills 90210 and at this point she was only 16 years old. Now just as her acting career was taking off, she also started dating and she was rumored to have been linked to Usher around 1995 and he later confirmed that she was his first celebrity kiss while she claimed that they never dated. She was also linked to rappers Mystical and Lazybone, although the last two were mainly rumors and were not confirmed. Then around 1997, she began dating her first real boyfriend and the brother of Master P, C Murder, who also happened to be 10 years her senior. It seemed like Monica was losing guidance at this time because she found herself straying away from her mother's teachings and religious beliefs, venturing further and further into the seedy underbelly of the streets like her father, who had taught her to shoot a gun at only 12 years old. Monica and Murder dated throughout 1997 before parting ways, although they remained friends, and Monica linked up with her first steady boyfriend, who just so happened to be a drug dealer, Jarvis Weems. Armed with a partner, she was ready to drop her sophomore album around 1998 and was about to enter the peak of her career. But before we get into her second album, what's beef? At this point in the world of music, getting in a beef was just part of the job. While today beefing is very direct and usually involves some heavy swearing and targeting on social media, back in the day it was fueled by subliminals, rumor mills and marketing and was used as a promotional technique to boost sales. As a result, this first beef became one of Monica's well-known beefs to this day. And of course, I'm talking about the infamous catfight between Monica and Brandy. What? You, okay, you take it out. Now Monica and Brandy were two of the leading ladies in R&B at the time, following in the footsteps of the legend herself, the late great Aaliyah. The thing is Monica and Brandy were very similar. Brandy was just a year older at 18 years old and she debuted a year prior to Monica around 1994. They were also both in the R&B world, so it was only a matter of time before they crossed paths. With Aaliyah in mind, out of the three girls Aaliyah was the grown one. Brandy was the more sweet and wholesome one, while Monica was an enigma from start to finish. In addition, Brandy was darker than Monica in complexion, with fuller lips. And you're probably thinking, like, Ali, why are you bringing this up? Well, it's because the public used these details to draw comparisons between the artists. They both worked closely with Whitney Houston, as Whitney was considered to be a mentor figure to them. And all of this information will become relevant as we go. Man, I have been sitting here waiting for her. Since I got here, I'm like, where's Whitney? Where's Whitney? Hey, baby girl! Like, <laughs> Only extra with this amazing video, the superstar surprising her biggest fan. Where you going? Don't you start crying and carrying on and stuff. Come here with your little pretty self. <laughs> I'm so proud of you! 
As a result, Monica and Brandy never really got along. Their beef was fueled by their marketing teams and their respective fan bases, which tended to overlap. But anyway, moving on to the topic of their feud, their song The Boy Is Mine. The idea for the collaboration came from Brandy and they teamed up with their respective main producers, Rodney Jerkins for Brandy and Dallas Austin for Monica to create the hit inspired by Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney's single The Girl Is Mine. As you can imagine, the song pits the two young women against each other as they both vie for the attention of a man. And when this song came out, it became one of the biggest hits of the summer. And this was around 1998. The single was a smash. It became the best-selling song in America for that year and earned two platinum certifications. Now perhaps the biggest surprise in this all is the pair had never met at the time they recorded the song. So clearly the tension between them was growing at this point. According to Dallas Austin, who recounted the incident on Vlad TV, Monica didn't like Brandy because of her clean-cut image. In fact, Monica didn't want to do the song at all, but Dallas talked her into it because that's what Clive Davis wanted. But Monica never liked Brandy, and Brandy, never, you know, she was like, the, Monica's very ghetto when it came down to it. She was like, she's too proper, and she's too this, and I think Brandy might have looked at her a certain way a couple of times and looked at her like the little, you know. And so from that point, it was just like, they, you know, even to have them do the boys, my Monica was like, nope, not doing no song with her. In the end, Brandy and Monica recorded their verses separately and when it came time to shoot the video they were separated between takes and had little to no actual interaction. We had never met when we recorded The Boy Is Mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was something a lot of people didn't know. We, she was working on her album with Rodney Jerkins mm -hmm. and they already had the song written and produced mm -hmm. and so they called me, I'm out in Atlanta doing country stuff mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> they had me come out here to uh, California and we recorded the record. That was our first time meeting. And did you guys maintain a relationship afterward? Not at all. No. We didn't, we didn't maintain a relationship because once the song was released, that's when all of the supposed, they don't like each other. This right, is it. The, right. And then it was created to be even bigger by the skits, all of the different stuff that was happening that came with the song. But since in the song we were feuding, it basically kind of created that atmosphere and it became almost like a real thing throughout uh -huh. teenage right. years. Yeah. But we're adults now. Yeah, no, yeah, I yeah. Mean, we, nobody got time to be nobody got In fact, the first time they truly got on stage together was at the 1998 VMAs and tensions quickly grew until Monica punched Brandy in the face. Allegedly, the altercation took place because of the simmering tensions between the two that had dated back to the video shoot when, in one of the only scenes the girls filmed together, Brandy put her finger in Monica's face during a part of the song. Now that scene was not included in the original video and instead we see them leaning back and forth into each other's faces. This is what Monica had to say on the matter. Brandy was ad-libbing about the situation and at one point she put her hand to my face, playing, and it upset me. That's the kind of stuff that becomes personal with me. Not because it was Brandy, that goes for anybody. This was the final nail in the coffin of Monica's opinion of Brandy. And the next time they saw each other, Monica let Brandy know how she felt about her. On the night of September 15th, 1998, moments before their first ever public performance of the song at the MTV Video Music Awards, Monica laid her eyes on Brandy and punched her in the face. Some people say Brandy pointing her finger in Monica's face was the reason why they fought. But according to Dallas, their situation was unavoidable and Monica attacked Brandy without being provoked. And the first time they actually saw each other to do it was, I think it was American Musical Awards or something. And before they could even get to the stage, Monica decked her in the face, <laughs> popped in the face backstage. And I'm like, oh my God, this is even before the performance. So everybody's trying to know how we're gonna have a performance that looked like they're not you know, at war with each other, but it worked out because the song was supposed to be at war with each other, so nobody could really tell that she had punched in the face before the performance. Now, despite the altercation, Monica and Brandy went on stage and did their performance brilliantly, and they never again got down and dirty in a brawl. Nonetheless, while the cat fight definitely did happen, back then it was not very easy to get video footage of incidents like this. 
And despite people constantly talking about what happened backstage, the girls were very dead set on keeping this incident private. In fact, for most of the 90s, the girls made it seem like they were actually friends. And Brandy had this to say on the matter. Monica and I are like two peas in a pod. We're like so cool. And you know, since people think that Monica and I are kind of like against each other and we're enemies, we decided to do a song where we talked about, you know, this boy is mine and you can't have him. And you know, just we're kind of like fighting in the song. But every time she comes with a lick, I come with a lick. And we're battling in the singing thing. And it's really cool, but we're friends. And we're cool. And no matter what anybody says, we're gonna, we're gonna stay tight. Meanwhile, around 1998, when Monica was promoting her sophomore album, she also insisted that they were cool. I think that there's not a reason in the world that we could not share the collaboration. When we did the song together, it was all of these misconceptions about controversy. But I think it kind of took the fun out of it for people to see that we got along. So from the sound of things, it seems like somebody from both camps was like, look, you guys have a number one song together. Let's not make your conflict public and let's keep making this money together. But while both artists said there was no beef for several more years, during an interview with Angie Martinez, all of this information came out to the public. In fact, during the interview, Monica shared some very specific information. Apparently the song belonged to Brandy, but Monica was so passive aggressive and also wanting the song to belong to her that she wound up naming her sophomore album The Boy Is Mine because she wanted to make a very bold statement. She may as well have called the song That Track Is Mine and called it a day. Nonetheless, they both stuck by their stories and eventually the rumor died down. The beef reignited in the second half of the 2010s, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll get back to Monica's beef with Brandy in a minute, but let's go back to the late 90s and discuss the biggest reason why Monica's career took a hit. Monica dropped The Boy Is Mine around 1998 and it picked a number 8 on the Billboard 200 and was Monica's most successful album to date. Proving that the album was a hit, it spawned 7 singles. The Boy Is Mine, The First Night, Angel Of Mine, Inside, Street Symphony, Gonna Be Fine and Right Here Waiting. Out of all the 7 singles, the first three songs were very successful, with all of them topping the Hot 100 chart, with The Boy Is Mine going double platinum, while the other two tracks earned platinum certification. Unfortunately, while Monica's professional life was flourishing, her personal life took several massive hits that eventually knocked her out of the game for a while. It all began around 1998. Remember her boyfriend, Jarvis Weems? Well, they began dating in that year. Monica was about to turn 18 years old and Jarvis was about 22. And it was during this time that Jarvis was struck by a very brutal tragedy. His brother, Troy Weems, passed away in a car crash at the age of 25 that same year. So Monica being the good girlfriend, decided to stick by Jarvis. And the thing is, it was during this time that she was experiencing the height of her success. She won a Grammy around 1999 and she appeared in an episode of the children's show All That as a musical guest the same year. She also landed her first role in a film, one called Boys and Girls. She was also in an episode of Cartoon Network's The Brack Show and she also appeared in a TV movie called Love Song. So, while she was truly taking off, Jarvis was descending into deep depression after the loss of his older brother. And at the same time, tragedy was beginning to strike closer to home for Monica. She experienced two personal losses back to back that would have a lasting impact on her and affect the entire trajectory of her career. The first loss was the loss of her cousin and best friend, Selena Glenn, who passed away from a brain aneurysm. Then, while she was still processing the loss of her cousin, as well as Troy's passing, everything became far too big for Jarvis to handle, and he passed away by his own hand. When you got there, what was happening? He was very somber. And that's when I knew that his mind was made up. Monica stood pleading, but Jarvis had locked the car doors. And were you aware there was a gun in the car? Absolutely. So you saw? Yes. Yeah. 
Did he say anything? Oh, yeah, he said a lot of things, which I feel like are definitely only for me. Most important thing that he said was that he loved me, and that nobody ever tried the way I tried. Monica was there when the whole incident took place, and it scarred her for life. After this, Monica veered away from the public eye, doing her contractually obligated appearances, but for the most part she was trying to keep herself together. Her mourning was only made more difficult by the media, because they kept posting headlines about Monica and the loss of her boyfriend. She was in an extreme amount of pain and would spend hours a day at Jarvis's grave as she tried to process her grief. Meanwhile, the hits continued to come her way as she then lost her grandmother while her first love and forever friend C. Murder had lived up to his name as he faced incarceration around 2002 for murder. Surrounded by so much death and heartbreak, Monica became more and more depressed and her family and friends encouraged her to seek professional help. Instead, she fell back on her faith of her youth, seeking spiritual guidance from her stepfather and tried to surround herself with friends and family. They provided unconditional support as she worked her way through her grief and they helped her do basic things like sleeping, eating, and otherwise helping her through the healing process until she was ready to take on music once again. At the time she said this of the experience. Most people I loved are either dead or in jail. For a while it was one day at a time. I didn't eat, didn't sleep or drink. I wondered how I would ever heal. But in the end, she did heal. The thing is she experienced all these tragedies when she was at the height of her career and she came out of this even stronger. However, her work output was diminishing. She had tried her very best to keep going through everything but her heart was not in it. For example, despite appearing in three films in 2000 and making her starring debut, she dialed back completely on acting, only appearing in an episode of Felicity in 2001 and nothing at all in 2002. Meanwhile in the background she was working on her next album, one called All Eyes On Me between 2000 and 2002. The thing is the album was actually supposed to come out around 2001 but because she was experiencing so much tragedy in her life she couldn't focus and the album got pushed back. Jarvis's death had everything to do with me not working. I was not able. I still can't carry the workload I was used to. I was working all these hours after it happened but I realized in the midst of everything I couldn't handle it. I'm not ashamed to say that I decided to step back and get the help I needed to really come from within. I think some of the best therapy for me was his daughter. All the things that surrounded me when he was alive that were not taken away from me when he was. It's like I found a way to balance it. I'm now able to talk about it whereas before this I could not get the words out of my mouth. So even though Monica was ready to return to the studio and drop music, 2001 was still too early for her to return despite what she was saying in interviews. So what happened to her album? Well. It came out around 2002 and had only two songs released from the project, namely Two Hood and All Eyes On Me. The thing is before the album came out in the US, it came out in Japan months prior and as a result the album was heavily bootlegged and found itself all over file sharing sites on the internet. As a result, the album was pulled back from the shelves and Monica was asked to redo the entire project and drop it as a fourth album. This proved to be a very smart move because All Lies On Me was doomed from the start. And I'll tell you why. In addition to working through her trauma, Monica hadn't dropped an album in about 4 years. Also, she was no longer working with Dallas Austin and had replaced him with Clive Davis who was the new executive producer on the album. Additionally, she left Arista for J Records and began writing her own tracks. And lastly the first single she dropped from the album was considered to be very pop and not like the R&B songs she had dropped in the past. So with all these things weighing against her, her album was doomed to flop before it even came out. I don't think people wanted to hear a big fun record from me after knowing all the things that I had personally experienced. Nonetheless. Monica was nothing if not a hard worker and she returned to the drawing board to rework her album as Clive had requested. After making a commitment to return to recording full time, 
The financial stakes were doubled and the album needed to recoup essentially double their production costs. To aid in this monumental feat, Monica was given new writers. She had a chance to work with Missy Elliott and also got a chance to work with Kanye West. Now after working with Missy, Monica was like, oh, I really vibe with her. And this collaboration provided three solid songs, including the massive hit So Gone, which helped to recapture Monica's dwindling fanbase. I'm so gone. See, I could hear the sound in my head, but I hadn't found anybody who could bring it to life. I don't play any instruments, so I could hear this old sound and this old feel in my head. Because my voice is that way, and the type of music I love is that way. But I couldn't find anybody to really get it. Missy knew exactly what I was talking about. She was pulling out and playing old records instead of constantly in there hitting synthesizers trying to come up with a new sound. The pair's musical chemistry was so undeniable that Clive opted to replace the former executive producer, Jermaine Dupri, with Missy Elliott. A choice that would prove to be the right move because the album recertified Monica as a genuine force in the industry. Cleverly titled, After the Storm, Monica's album dropped around 2003. After the storm was a deeply personal smash, reflecting the traumas that she had been through. For example, on the song You Should Have Known Better, Monica speaks about a woman who stands by her man during a jail sentence, which is closely related to her relationship with C. Murder. She also had a song called I Wrote This, a song that detailed her complicated relationship with Weems and his choice to leave her. Now this album was an immediate success, debuting at number one on the Billboard 200, and selling about 185,000 copies in its first week, setting a career record for Monica. It spawned three singles, So Gone, which was a top 10 hit on the Hot 100, another single was You Should Have Known, and the third single was called Knock Knock, Get It Off. I'm so gone, so now at the end of the day, this album proved that Monica still had it, and because she chose to pour her personal experiences into the music, people could relate to it. And as a result, Monica's career began to improve. Meanwhile, she briefly returned to acting in 2003, landing roles in episodes of American Dreams and American Juniors, the latter of which she appeared in as a guest judge. I've been waiting such a long time just trying to get the room. Now while Monica was not as big as she was in the 90s, everything was occurring at Monica's own pace. She controlled her music output to a T and began to rebalance her life to focus on the things that really matter, like family and love. And she began to take breaks from her career very regularly, starting around 2004 when she found out she was pregnant with her first child. Her child's father, Rodney Rock Hill, had been on the scene since shortly after Jarvis passed away meeting Monica at the time when she was at her weakest. They began dating towards the end of the year 2000, and he proposed to her during their first Christmas together, going steady for the next four years until a brief split around 2004, in which Monica dated Young Buck of G-Unit. Now Monica's relationship with Young Buck did not last very long, apparently because Monica was still deeply in love with Rock. So she returned to his side and decided to work on raising the baby together. Now, after learning she was pregnant, Monica's relationship with music changed dramatically because she now had new priorities. She disappeared from entertainment for about two years, focusing instead on becoming a mother. Her and Rocco's first son, Rodney Ramon Hill III, affectionately dubbed Little Rock, was born around May of 2005. Interestingly, her relationship with her step-cousin Ludacris also got improved as Luda became the kid's godfather. So. Monica spent the rest of the year with her new baby, she began to find joy in life again, and this is when her life began to improve. When talking about her kid, she said the following, I love it. It's crazy because he's 15 months old and he's walking and talking. He really just gives me a reason to just wake up in the morning. You can't live for something like music or other people. You really can't do that. But when it comes to him, he is my number one priority. And he usually travels with me. This is the first trip he hasn't taken. Now, after taking the time to truly enjoy being a mother, Monica planned her return to the music industry. Despite making her original comeback around 2003, 
The long hiatus she took to focus on her family made it seem like album number 5 was a second comeback rather than a continuation of album number 4 that it was. Titled The Makings of Me, the album came out around 2006 and surprisingly, it took 3 years to make. Now while Monica didn't receive any songwriting credits on the project, she did help to formulate the songs by writing poems which were quickly turned into songs by her songwriting team. Now despite being praised by critics, the album didn't do well sales-wise. It peaked at number 8 on the Billboard 200 and sold about 93,000 copies in its first week. Now unfortunately, this is where Monica began to slow it down musically. This was her first album to not receive a RIAA certification and the singles that came off this album didn't really do well. The singles included Every Time the Beat Drop, A Dozen Roses, Sideline Ho, and Hell No. Now I ain't talking about a little too I'm talking about something that I make you swear. Now according to Monica, the reason why the album didn't do very well was because the first single didn't represent her album and it didn't speak to her core audience. To date, the album The Makings of Me remains her lowest selling project. Meanwhile, Monica's entire life was in a state of transition as she changed once more, going from a teen sensation to a heartbroken young woman to a healing and more self-assured mother. She also slowly began drifting from her mentor, Dallas Austin, with the song Sick and Tired from the soundtrack of the 2005 film Diary of a Mad Black Woman, serving as one of the last to be produced by him. At the same time, she made a brief return to acting around 2006 with a cameo in the comedy film ATL. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Y'all need anything else? Nah, nah we all right. But for the most part, she was focusing on being a mom. She continued to work on music, but it was on the back burner. And it would be another four years before she dropped album number six. Meanwhile, in the first half of 2007, she fell pregnant again. And her and Rocco got more serious as the pair got engaged. Now, shortly after Christmas, Monica gave birth to a beautiful baby boy whom she named Romelo Montez Hill in honor of her younger brother. This time around, she tried to balance being an artist and a mother. And around August of 2008, she dropped the promotional single, Still Standing. And this was supposed to be the lead single from her next album. In the meantime, Monica kept working. She appeared on a song with Keisha Cole, one called Trust, and she continued to act but in that same year, she landed her own TV show, one called Monica Still Standing, which aired on BET. The show focused on her career and her musical comeback. And to be frank, the show was a hit, garnering 3.2 million views between its first and second episodes. So, following the show's completion, Monica's album number 6, Still Standing, was announced for March of 2010 and was expected to do good numbers. She was cruising at the time. But unfortunately, as seemingly her pattern in the industry, whenever she achieves her highest success, her personal life comes crashing down and 2010 was no different. Surrounded by rumors swirling that Rocco had been cheating on her, she formally announced the split on Twitter two weeks ahead of her album's scheduled release. In interviews, she did not want to talk about the matter and kept brushing it off. The thing is, Monica wanted things to stay private, but she did drop a very suggestive tweet. Thank you everyone for all the love you're sending. Rocca is a great father and we will continue to love and parent our children. The rest is a private matter between Rocco and I. He's a good person. We all make mistakes. Even separated, we will always be family. Despite the heartbreak that Monica was facing, she was still about her business and she dropped her album still standing at the end of March. Now critically, the project was well received. It peaked at number 2 on the Billboard 200 and sold about 184,000 copies in its first week. So, as you can tell, Monica was making a comeback. The album was eventually certified gold by the RIAA and it even earned a Grammy nomination for Best R&B Album in 2011. As for the singles, three were released namely, Everything To Me, Love All Over Me, and Here I Am. To me. Hey. 
her while Monica's musical journey was once again flourishing. She had also began a whirlwind romance with NBA player Shannon Brown. After splitting from Rocco, her on-again off-again fiancé of 10 years, in early March of 2010 she met the Hooper in June while looking for someone to play the part of her love interest for the music video of her song Love All Over Me. He clearly did because the pair began dating soon after and four months later announced their engagement around October of 2010. Now one thing you can say about Monica is she's very serious about her relationships as all of them have been very long term. She switches up one long term partner for another in a very short amount of time. So this was seemingly her pattern. This time around she actually got the wedding and a month later the pair married in a secret ceremony inside their home. Now people didn't really find out about this marriage until around 2011. So when Shannon confirmed it in an interview, the pair then held a bigger ceremony for friends and family in July of 2011. So by the end of the year, Monica was pregnant again. In 2013, she gave birth to their first daughter together, one named Leia Shannon Brown. So just like she would do in the past, when Monica gave birth to her kid, she decided to take a break from the industry once again and focus on raising her child. But luckily this time around, she managed to squeeze out one more album before her scheduled hiatus. Titled New Life, the album came out around April of 2012. It peaked at number 4 on the Billboard 200 and sold about 69,000 copies in its first week. And it also spawned 4 singles namely, Anything, Until She's Gone, It All Belongs To Me and Without You. Now, all of these songs missed the Hot 100 entirely. However, Without You became her last charting single. Also, remember the Monica and Brandy beef that took place early in her career? Well, Monica and Brandy actually reunited for the song It All Belongs To Me and this was the first time in 14 years that they collaborated. To the public, the song seemingly certified the end of their feud and once again the pair denied that there was a feud to begin with. However, their formal truce would last for about 4 years before the claws came out once again. But for the time being, they were gushing about each other, praising each other and claimed their love to work with each other. But this mostly came from the mouth of Brandy. The energy was so magical. I was just so excited to see her again, just to work with her again. The session was great, it was like it was meant to be. It was like we never missed a beat. We were taking pictures and talking about all times. The only reason why it felt like a session was because we had to sing. But other than that, it just felt like we were catching up and reminiscing on everything. I wonder if Brandy reminisced about the time Monica's fist hit her face. Huh. So as always, Monica was much more reserved, although in the case of this beef she had always been the instigator. So the pair was supposed to perform at Clive Davis's legendary pre-Grammy party in 2012 but the performance was cancelled after the untimely passing of Whitney Houston. Now Houston was a huge mentor to both of them so it was hard for them to hear the news of her passing. She told me, I never met anybody that I saw myself in and the fact that I was signed and discovered singing the greatest love of all, you know, it's just been a rough week overall. But I recognize that she and I both outside of music had a lot in common and our love for God and our belief in Christ was one of those things and it's kept me strong and kept me fighting for what it is she loved. And that is family first, music and the rest is second. The other day she came in and her mine and brand song and she walks up to me and she goes, you killing that run at the end. You know she kept saying it and she was like, and you know I know you stole that from me, right? When I was 18, I lost my grandmother. I lost, I witnessed a suicide. I lost my cousin. Whitney didn't call on the phone. Three black trucks pulled up in the hood and she jumped out. Now despite yet another personal loss, Monica was now getting pretty good at handling heartbreak. She was also a legend in her own right and a 32-year-old mother of two sons, soon to be pregnant with the third. So as we said earlier, following putting out and promoting her album, Monica retreated from the spotlight once again to focus on her pregnancy and afterwards her daughter. She did a little bit of work here and there, appearing on the soundtrack of the 2013 film The Best Man Holiday. 
She also began working on her next album, which would only come out around 2015. But before that, she made headlines for beefing with Sierra. How are you? Amazing. How are you, sis? Situated. Oh. I know you came in sideways. It all began when Sierra was splitting up from Future. The pair had an almost two-year relationship beginning at the start of 2013, although the pair were spotted together before that. So by October of the same year, Future and Sierra were engaged. By January of 2014, Sierra announced that she was pregnant with their baby, being born four months later in May. So by August of 2014, just over a year and a half after they were first confirmed to be dating, news broke that she had ended their engagement. The cause? Future was sneaking around with stylist Tyrena Lee. <laughs> Sensational. So, Future and Sierra briefly got back together and tried to do things for their kid, but ultimately this didn't work out. It was around this time that Monica and Sierra began to beef and it became apparent to the world after Sierra dropped a subliminal tweet aimed at Monica in early September. Some people be preaching to people, but be the most crooked. Hashtag cold world. Now this sent the rumor mill into overdrive when insiders claimed the tweet was aimed at Monica because apparently Monica knew something about Future's extracurricular activities. So Monica then denied the accusation that she was the reason that she and Cece had a falling out insisting that their feud had nothing to do with Future or his baby mamas. They say I was friends with somebody he was cheating with. None of that stuff is true. I am friends with one of the mothers of one of Future's children. But it's the mom that you never see, you never hear. The one that Sierra also has a good relationship with. So a lot of the stuff you read is very untrue. Nothing that happened with us had anything to do with him. Now with that being said, Monica is not exactly known for being honest about the people she's beefing with. I mean, she spent years denying her beef with Brandy. So when Monica said what she had to say, a lot of people were like, hmm, is she telling the truth? Monica then went on to reveal that she had been close friends with Sierra since they were children. She also says she viewed Sierra as a sister and they had enjoyed about two decades of friendship before the disagreement that led to them eventually falling out. Monica said, she and I did have a disagreement. We both had issues with each other. When you have been friends for a long time, almost two decades, and you let things fester and you don't talk about them, it can cause a breakdown that other people may not understand. Now, despite the weird blood between them at the time, Monica insisted that she still loved and supported Sierra and was happy for her finding a new love with quarterback Russell Wilson. The pair made up behind the scenes and Monica confirmed two years later that they were friends once again. However, they would never be as close as they once were. We're great now, and I hope that other people are over it and move on. I mean, it was very short-lived because when I love someone, I love them forever. It used to be a idea. Where there's smoke, there was fire. Nowadays, things that are on the blogs have zero truth. I mean, I have read things where not one sentence of two or three paragraphs will have any truth. So the stuff that you read wasn't true anyway. But what did take place? You know, we kept that amongst us and it's done. You move on the way sisters do. It's the way family members do. You got to just keep pushing and when you love somebody, you love them forever. And that's the way I am. So apart from the brief moment in the headlines, Monica kept her head down and cruised below the radar of public attention for another year, focusing instead on her little family and beloved children. She then dropped album number eight and latest to date, Code Red. And this one came out around December of 2015. Oh. The album was meant to call attention to the changing landscape of R&B and according to her, she didn't like the way R&B was evolving over time. She felt like R&B was losing its soul and she wanted to bring it back. Sadly, the album failed to do that. It picked the number 27 on the Billboard 200 and only sold about 35,000 copies in its first week. Now because of the lacking sales, it only spawned one single, one titled Just Right For Me and despite having Lil Wayne on the track, it failed to blow up. Now since then, Monica has not dropped another album. 
She has dropped singles from time to time, and perhaps a result of the album's poor sales, she left her label around 2016. So, realizing that music had changed so much over time, Monica now shifted her focus to TV. She had a minor role in the film Almost Christmas, and was also a guest co-host on the talk show The Real. Also around 2016, bygones could not be bygones, because the beef between Brandy and Monica reignited. This time, however, no fists were thrown, but Brandy took every chance she had to throw shade at Monica. It all began around August of 2016, with the trending hashtag so gone challenge. During this challenge, people were asked to freestyle their own verses over the instrumental version of Monica and Missy Elliott's song, So Gone. So, when a fan asked Brandy if she'd ever hop on the track, Brandy responded with only two words, Chile, bye. There was a fan that um, sent uh, a tweet to Brandy and asked her, you know, would you do the So Gone Challenge? And she said, child, bye. <laughs> now, you know, it wouldn't be the real if we didn't ask you, how you feel about that? I'll tell you the real, I'm not bothered at all. <laughs> That's right. I am, uh, you know, I'm, this is what I always say. You, <laughs> Honestly, um, the old me and the new me are two different things. Mm -hmm. And this journey of self-progression and self-love and empowerment that I'm on, I can't go backwards. I, I think that that was just a test from God for me. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that she was one of the most legendary people and uh, has one of the most amazing voices and her runs and riffs. After this, Monica did not respond, which somehow made Brandy even angrier. Then around November of 2016, the feud stepped up a notch and even got more personal when Brandy got territorial over Whitney Houston. The thing is Monica appeared on an episode of Oprah's Where Are They Now? And in the interview, she spoke about her relationship with the legendary singer and referred to her as a fairy godmother, a role she added Whitney had played for many people. I'm a fairy godmother. And that's so cool. You're cool with that. I'm cool with that. This did not sit well with Brandy, who had actually been handpicked by Whitney to play the role of the first black Cinderella in the 1997 adaptation. And so the beef between Monica and Brandy began again. Now insiders say that Whitney was too old to play the role of Cinderella. And when Whitney realized this, she passed the role down to Brandy. Now after Monica's interview with Oprah, Brandy would later go onto Instagram to share a photo of Whitney Houston and captioned it using Monica's exact phrasing. Everybody wanted what we had slash have, and I am blessed enough to have been your friend. Hashtag fairy goddaughter, and make history with you as my hashtag fairy godmother. And now you're my angel. I wish that you were here in the physical to witness so much of my courage that you stayed on me about. But I know you're watching, and I know what you expect me to do. Our bond is unmatched, I love you nippy. Now that wasn't aimed at anyone at all, but the fact that it came after Monica spoke to Oprah, that said a lot. And once again Monica took the high road and opted not to respond. But Brandy was not done yet, and at the 2016 Soul Train Awards, she took a dig at Monica once again when she changed the lyrics of her song Talk About Our Love, claiming that Monica's fan base came after her. I know somebody's lying. It's always something. Talking ish again and then your whole fan base jumps in. Now the whole gram's buzzing. Now this time around, Monica did respond. Monica took the high road this time, and instead of dissing Brandy, she chose to compliment her and shed some light on Brandy's accomplishments. Love that goes both ways. It's disappointing to leave ICU and come to my page to see the foolishness over the 90s ever so present amongst both groups. I will forever respect the legend she is and the history we created. All of you guys do the same. She's a vocal beast and we're both great in our own right. This is her moment. She earned it and deserves it. No mention or at of my name needed. Now the feud would persist over the course of the next few years, becoming more and more loaded from Brandy's side. In 2017, Monica made a post about Whitney on the late singer's page with a caption that included, You will forever be the greatest. You will forever be missed. Brandy later made her own post honoring the singer, in which she thanked her for trusting her with the torch. While this wasn't exactly aimed at Monica, Brandy had spent the last few months of 2016 bashing her, 
And so Monaco fans began to bash Brandy in turn. This clearly hit a nerve with Brandy, and Brandy asked Monica to check her fans. She said, Monica really needs to check her evil ass fans. It's so much stuff I can post about the hateful things they say to me, but I will never have time for that, always thinking something is about her. It's not. But it seems like Brandy was the only one making any situation about Monica. In 2018, Brandy again made a dig at Monica during a performance, and this time there was nothing subliminal about it. While performing their OG duet, The Boy Is Mine, towards the end of the song she specified that the song was hers, referring to Monica's bold decision to name her own album after the song. The song is mine, I gotta claim what's mine. If I don't got the boy, I've got the song. You know what I'm saying? At the time, Monica still refused to give in to Brandy's antagonism and ignored the snub publicly, although she did have something to say on social media. Taking to Instagram, she posed in satin pajamas and flip-flops and captioned the image. I conduct myself in the manner I would like to be remembered. The work I have to do within myself leaves no room to focus on anybody else. Always bettering me for my husband and babies. Now the beef kind of fizzled out after that, but it was clear that Brandy still had salty feelings towards Monica. In 2020, Monica and Brandy appeared in a versus together, and during it, things got super awkward. I've been on my best behavior the last few years. Good. But there was a time when you were not. When I was kicking in doors and smacking chicks. You sure was. I was um I've what? been delivered. I've been delivered. Since But I did know, make a little song about it. Wait, since people know what? Since people know about it, I was one of them ones. One of them ones that what? That what followed was a super cringy back and forth where Monica finally put Brandy in her place, calling her out every time she tried to backtrack because she was making her sound abusive. You? Well, no, you didn't kick in my door. Right. So why would you say I, you I, was I'm one sorry. of the ones? I, should, I shouldn't have said that. That's probably going to go viral. I shouldn't have said that. I'm no. so sorry, y'all. I didn't mean no shade by I that. I just said I was, I was trying to make a, I was trying to make a joke. You know, I tried to work on my comedy. What had happened was... I was trying to work on my comedy. We had a disagreement. That's, that's what happened. I know. We had a disagreement. And... This mean you're not going to do the tour? I'm sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was a mistake. You know what? Eventually, Brandy apologized for the poor joke, but the moment still went viral. I was afraid of doing the verses, mm -hmm. not afraid of anything other than the fact that I enjoy people now understand that they can love us both. Yes. And I didn't want to do anything that reignited the feelings of yesteryear. You can love Monica and Brandy. Mm -hmm. She is mm -hmm. the consummate professional. Yep. An amazing, I mean, amazing singer songwriter. Her tone is next to none. We're not to be compared. We're polar opposites. We have completely different backgrounds and upbringings. Our subject matters are typically different. I don't understand why people don't understand they right. can love both. Yes. And so that was my reservation. But after talking to her and Larry Jackson, who you know as well, oh, I, yes. Swiss Beats and everybody that was involved, they said it will be a celebration of music. It is. And that was mm -hmm. our goal in that moment. So I'm glad that we did it. And we did it in Atlanta where I'm from. Listen, I'm grateful that y'all did it. <laughs> now following that encounter, things finally began to settle down between Monica and Brandy. Monica then founded her own imprint, Mon Denise Music, and released the first single on it called Commitment, which became a sleeper hit and one of her first songs to hit the charts in about nine years. During the same year of the verses, she dropped a song called Trenches and another song called Pink, clearly signifying that Monica was not done with music. Unfortunately, around this same time, Monica and Shannon Brown ended their marriage and Monica changed her last name back to Arnold single now right right at, well mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus I'm in the middle of a divorce you're in the middle of a divorce mm -hmm. so the kids are impacted by that just like the parents right? they're definitely impacted yeah. even even more than us because we know what's taking place sometimes when they don't mm -hmm. and their minds they're always trying to figure it out mm. since then Monica seems to be focusing on herself she promised album number nine, which she hasn't dropped yet, although she has dropped the singles Friends, Trusting God, 
and letters between 2022 and 2023. Monica has also began focusing on reality TV and has seemingly been single ever since, focusing instead on her children and herself. And that's essentially the story of Monica. Ultimately, the R&B scene changed too much in the early 2000s for Monica to keep up. She experienced a lot of losses in her life and fell pregnant several times, causing her to distance herself from music time and time again. By the time Monica returned to music, things had changed. Music was different. And that's okay because not many artists can stay on top forever. Monica did have beef with Sierra, Brandy, but those seem to have fizzled out. And for now, she seems to be focusing on raising her children. Monica made real music, so she still gets a lot of streams on Spotify, getting over 5 million monthly listeners. And her most listened to songs are The Boy Is Mine, Angel Of Mine, Love Enough, So Gone, and For You I Will. So talented, Gabby. <laughs> That's it for me, it's your boy Ali. What happened to Monica, in your opinion? Let me know down below. Also, add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music. Till next time, peace.